this is a bit of a controversial topic to a certain degree because uh, there's a lot of confusion currently um, regarding the, this family of tumors. These are very rare, about 20% of all lung tumors are thought to belong to the neuroendocrine family of tumors. And uh, these basically constitute a family of related lesions that share in common uh, features either at the ultra-structural or immunity chemical level of neuroendocrine differences. Um, and they can show a spectrum of maturation. It goes from very well differentiated tumors, uh, low grade tumors, to very high grade and very poorly differentiated neoplasm. Um, the classification that is currently used, of course, is the WHO. And uh, we now have a new version of the WHO, the 2015 edition of WHO classification, uh, where we have again Dr. Travis as the main um, um, editor with. Um, some European uh, pathologists. And uh, in the chapter on neuroendocrine tumors of the lung, the classification that is presented is quite simple. There are basically four categories, uh, carcinoid tumor, atypical carcinoid, small cell carcinoma, and large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma. Um, these two terms in particular are pretty old terms. They've been around for more than 30 years or so. And, um, and there has been a push to try to change that situation, and we'll look into that later. But uh, as far as the WHO is concerned, the criteria for the diagnosis of neuroendocrine tumors is based on uh, primarily on histology, um, which includes the, the pattern of growth of the lesions. Um, but the main emphasis has really been placed on mitotic activity. And they have this very, um, I don't want to use the word rigid, but certainly very strict uh, categorization of tumors based on the number of mitoses and um, anything that is between zero to two mitoses per 10 high product fields falls into the um, group of carcinoid tumors. Uh, two to 10 would be a typical carcinoid and over 10 would correspond to either the large cell or the carcinoma or the small cell carcinoma. They also mentioned in passing necrosis, but this is not really emphasized or stressed by the WHO, and they indicate that necrosis is absent in carcinoid tumors. They can be very minimal in focal in atypical carcinoids and usually extensive in the small cell cancer. So current concepts regarding these so-called carcinoid tumors is that these tumors are not necessarily benign. Uh, because if these tumors are left unchecked, they're going to they're going to grow indiscriminately. They will invade. They will get into the bloodstream. They will metastasize, and they will kill the patient. Um, so they have a definite potential for malignant behavior. And in fact, if you read the literature, the numbers vary from 15 to 30 percent. The times that a pulmonary carcinoma tumor will already have metastasized to the lymph node. So to speak of these tumors as if they were benign um, is, is really a, a disservice to the patient uh, because of their malignant potential. Um, and then we have to recognize the fact that uh, all these tumors really form part of a single family or a single spectrum of lesions uh, that can go from very well differentiated to poorly differentiated tumors. And there are always a spectrum in transitions between these that if you pay attention, if you look closely at resected specimens of these neuroendocrine tumors in the lung, you will be able to find areas that look a little bit worse, a little bit better, et cetera, et cetera, even though the overall diagnosis that you make is either carcinoid, a typical carcinoid, or uh, small cell carcinoma. So um, the current tendency by most pathologists outside of the group who's in charge of the WHO classification has been to term these tumors neuroendocrine carcinomas. And there seems to be quite a push for categorizing all neuroendocrine tumors of the lung, with the exception of incidental tumorlets or small, minute carcinoid tumors, to categorize them as neuroendocrine carcinomas. And uh, there have been at least these two proposals that have been presented in the literature, Cerelia et al., which is the group of Dr. Mark Wick, the University of Virginia uh, proposed that they should be graded. They should be called neuroendocrine carcinoma grade one, grade two, grade three. 
Um, we presented with Dr. Moran a few years ago this proposal for um, categorizing them based on the degree of differentiation. And to call them well differentiated during the current carcinoma, uh, moderately and poorly differentiated. So we do have some problems for classification currently. Um, because the WHO proposal is based strictly on cytologic criteria, um, that sort of limits us a little bit in, in how to approach these lesions. Um, the new proposal is based on a combination of cytological and architectural features of during differentiation. One of the things that you will notice as you look at these tumors, if you, if you have the opportunity to see many of them, is that there seems to be a very repetitive and consistent pattern that is observed with these tumors, that more differentiated of these tumors have a tendency to show a very organoid uh, or neuroendocrine type of growth pattern, whereas the more aggressive the tumor be becomes, the more this growth pattern that, that is organoid is lost. So architecture seems to mirror the degree of differentiation of these tumors and also its biologic behavior. So in the current approach, there is a distinction made between moderately uh, differentiated and poorly differentiated neuroendocrine carcinomas that is still problematic and often arbitrary when you use the WHO criteria, uh, particularly when you're trying to distinguish among these, these types of tumors. So a comparison of the proposed new terminology, whether you use the well-differentiated terminology or the grade one, grade two, and grade B, um, in comparison with uh, what has been traditionally used would pan out in here, you know, well differentiated would map out to carcinoid tumors, moderately differentiated or grade two would be the equivalent of what is now uh, being called by the WHO a typical carcinoid, and fully differentiated uh, would correspond to all of these types of tumors which are still in use. Um, if you check the WHO fascicle, you're going to find that all of these entities are included um, as variants of a small cell carcinoma or large cell carcinoma by them. So what are some of the proper, what are some of the problems and controversies? We have, um, there is a problem with what is the proper de definition and uh, terminology to be used with these tumors. There's also an issue with reproducibility for diagnosis, and uh, I'm going to be showing you a little bit of what is out there in the literature regarding this topic in, in a few minutes. Um, we have lack of precise cutoffs to separate intermediate grade from high grade and low grade from intermediate grade neuroendocrine carcinomas, even by the current WHO standards. Um, with regards to the cells, um, you know, we Pay attention to the cells. You'll notice that the high-end tumors are classified into small cell and large cell, uh, poorly differentiated or grade three neuroendocrine carcinoma. Um, there's a considerable overlap between the size of the cells, between the so-called small cells and the large cells. And signing the tumor specifically to one or the other can sometimes be quite a task. Um, again, the role of psychology uh, versus histology has not been clearly emphasized or defined. And also, we do have some inconsistencies and issues with the role of immunohistochemical stains on these tumors. This is a paper that was published back in 1998, and uh, uh, fortunately our memories are short. Um, so now that we have the 2015 histologic classification uh, by the same uh, author, um, we forget that it was only a few years ago that uh, he had this study with a group of very prominent pulmonary pathologists in which they reviewed a large number of these tumors and tried to just simply classify them based on the H&E. And unanimous agreement among the six experienced pulmonary pathologists was only achieved in 58% of the cases that were diagnosed as carcinoid tumors only half of the tumors that were, had the diagnosis of a typical carcinoid, people were able to agree on, and only 40% of the cases that had the diagnosis of a large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma. So we're dealing here with six very prominent, very famous pulmonary pathologists who presumably know more than the rest of us in, in this room. 
and they can seem to be able to get it right all the time. So there is an, an issue there that, that needs to be acknowledged, please. Um, there was this very interesting study by Dr. Marchewski from uh, Cedar sinai in Los Angeles in which she did a morphometric, a very, very sophisticated morphometric study um, on, on, on these tumors. And what he found was that there was considerable nuclear, nuclear size overlap in high grade lung nerve and neoplasm. Approximately one third of non small cell lung cancers exhibited a considerable number of neoplastic cells that were three times larger than normal lymphocytes, while two thirds of large cell neuroendocrine carcinomas have a predominant number of small cells. So we're really entering an area that is problematic. And uh, the, I, I see these tumors very often because I sign on pulmonary pathology and I get these cases sent to me in consultation and I struggle. I struggle with trying to fit these into whatever the WHO book is now proclaiming and, and it can be very difficult at times because of all of these circumstances. It's, it's you know, the solution is not simple. It's not as cut and dry as it is presented in the book where they say this is carcinoid, this is a typical carcinoid, etc. Uh, mitotic counts. Mitotic counts is a big problem. You know, I took a look at the literature on atypical carcinoids, and uh, these are only four, four of the 400 papers published on atypical carcinoids. And back in 2000, um, in 2011, um, this author said that more than two mitosis per 10 high power fields uh, uh, is, is what you need to find in a typical carcinoid. Then if you go back to 1998, Dr. Travis again, two to 10 mitosis, and of course this is a paper that is the basis or the reference for the WHO because this is what Dr. Travis indicates in the WHO book, that that's the criteria for a typical a carcinoma, it has to be between two and, 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 and 10. However, this large study from Great Britain, 1994, only four years earlier, four to 80, eight zero mitosis in what in Great Britain they were calling a typical carcinoma. And Dr. Stacy Mills from University of Virginia, back in 1982, also presented his series, and he found two to 28. So the, the spectrum, it, it you know, this, this paper is based on 25 or 28 cases. Um, you know, it hasn't really been studied in the more longitudinal way, the more comprehensive way. And I suspect that if we were to do a study, a more multi-institutional multi study with larger numbers, that, uh, that these numbers would most likely have to be modified. There are also the limitations that we encounter in assigning a specific diagnosis for a neuroendocrine carcinoma on a small biopsy sample. Um, making a diagnosis based on cell size and cell logic features can be extremely problematic and unreliable if you only have a very tiny small biopsy. Mitotic counts. You may not have 10 high powered fields in an endobronchial lung biopsy. <clears throat> so if the criteria that is spelled out by the WHO is that you need to have between two to 10, or zero to two, or more than 10 to make one or another diagnosis, and you can't count those 10 high power fields, what do you do? How do you resolve that problem? Again, to emphasize, this has been currently underemphasized, if not neglected, which is architecture and growth pattern. And another problem that we have with small biopsies is how do you separate a large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma from an atypical carcinoid? And that may be very difficult, if not impossible. So when it comes to the well-differentiated tumors, the carcinoids, we should expect that those would be the easy ones because they're at the far end of the spectrum. Those are the well-differentiated ones, the ones with the ones with a nice nested growth pattern. Um, the ones that don't have mitotic activity, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we're expecting that there should be a very nice organoid pattern of nests, islands, ribbons, festoons. The cells should always be relatively small with normal neutrocytoplasmic ratios, typical chromatin pattern, the 
the salt and pepper, uh, chromatin, absence of nucleoli, low mitotic activity, and then immune histochemistry, chemistry, strong immune activity for endurance markers, and the strong positivity for cytokeratin and absence of staining for TTF1. And here you have some typical examples of carcinoid tumors of the lung um, with different morphologies. Here are the nested pattern of growth. Uh, this is a uh, trabecular growth pattern. This is a sort of serpiginous serpentine, oops, uh, serpentine kind of pattern. Um, and these are very easy to diagnose when you have a resection specimen. The problem is in the endoscopic biopsies, it may end up looking like this. And the endocrine growth pattern, the organoid growth pattern can very often be totally lost in these small biopsies, either because of distortion, mechanical distortion, or because the amount of tissue that has been sampled is too small. And these are other views from this very same biopsy. And you can see here a lot of this crushing artifact with a few cells interspersed in here. But then you start seeing this and you start getting nervous. Well, why is there crushed artifact here? Could it be that this could be a small cell cancer? Then you look at better preserved areas. If you have these better preserved areas and you can see that, you know, this is open salt and pepper chromatin and they, you know, there's no mitotic activity and so on and so forth, you start feeling a little bit more, more confident. Um, but it can look like this. This is from the very same bias. Now it starts looking sort of infiltrated. And look at all the crushing. You know, it is enough to make anybody nervous. Of course, you help yourself with the immune chemical stains. You want to make sure you're dealing with a neuron consumer. You do a chromogranin. Uh, if you have very strong uniform positivity for chromogranin, like you see here, then you can put it all together and come to the conclusion that you're more, most likely dealing with a carcinoid tumor rather than a small cell carcinoma. I'm going to show you later. Um, seeing this type of positivity in a small cell carcinoma is that extremely rare. Here you have another example endoscopic biopsy and well differentiated neuroendocrine carcinoma. Here's the overlying uh, squamous epithelium uh, bronchial glands. And you have this mass of tumor cells. And then you see them at higher magnification. And then when you look at them at higher power, lo and behold, the nuclear detail is lost. And what you see is smudged nuclei. Very similar to what you would expect in a small cell cancer. The tip, the tip off, in this particular case, what tells you that you're not dealing with a small cell cancer is look at the amount of cytoplasm surrounding each one of these nuclei. And that would be a normal or unheard of for a small cell cancer. So if you have, even if you have loss of the nuclear chromatin characteristic, for a well differentiated neuroendocrine carcinoma or, or carcinoid tumor. Uh, the fact that these tumor cells are very uniform and they all have abundant cytoplasm should be a tip off that you're dealing uh, with uh, a, a carcinoid. And here's your chromogranin stain in this particular case. Notice the diffuse and very convincing positivity. Here's another, uh, another case, another endoscopic uh, lung biopsy. And here you have it in higher magnification again, just you know, dark hyperchromatic nuclei without any nuclear detail. But notice the sort of organoid architecture, very subtle, but it is there. And also notice the abundance of cytoplasm. Now there are many types of growth patterns that can be seen in well differentiated neuroendocrine carcinomas or so-called carcinoid tumors. The most common one, of course, is the organoid, also known by the German name of Salbalen. Uh, but then you can have a trabecular growth pattern, ribbon-like. They can be spindle, and you have to beware uh, with a spindle cell tumor in the lung. It could be either a spindle cell carcinoma, or it could also be a spindle cell variant of small cell cancer. Uh, they can be pigmented, oncocytic, mucinous. They can cribriform, they can form glandular structures or rosettes. And you have to be aware of the fact of all these different uh, growth patterns. Here we have an example that is pseudoglandular. Um, this is a higher magnification. It seems to be forming these lumens. Um, but when you stain it up, it's positive for chromogranins, naphthysin, et cetera. Here's an example of the spindle cell variant. Um, here's one that's forming all these beautiful rosettes. 
another one that is showing this sort of trabecular pattern and sort of microacetal. So these are all nice when you have resections. When you have biopsies on these, it can turn into a difficult proposition. Here's another higher power on a uh, carcinoid tumor. Very nicely developed um, cell volume. And if you look at the cells themselves, they have a hint of a salt and pepper chromatin, not very nicely developed, it's not the best. But then again, notice the abundance of cytoplasm surrounding these cells. Here's another example of a carcinoid or well-differentiated neuroendocrine carcinoma. Again, not much of an organoid pattern. You can sort of get a sense, of sort of a hint. Maybe there is some cribiforming here, um, sort of aborted trabeculae, um, but not much to go by. In fact, it seems to be falling apart. And that's one of the things that happens to heart carcinoids when you do endoscopic biopsies on them. They either clump together or they start just becoming disaggregated and falling apart. And then the growth pattern that, that will help you making that diagnosis is distorted and can be very difficult to identify. This is another thing that can happen to carcinoid tumors in the lung. And uh, this is a biopsy that we had here at the medical college. It had all this dystrophic calcification. And I was wondering what, what in heavens had been biopsy and what, what did they see on the x-ray because it all, all seemed to be bone but then inside of the bony trabeculae you could see this population of very monotonous uniform cells uh, with abundant eosinophilic cytoplasm and, and that's a carcinoid with dystrophic calcification. Now when it comes to moderately differentiated neuroendocrine carcinomas what is today regarded as an atypical carcinoid in the WHO uh, this represents essentially an intermediate form between typical carcinoid or well differentiated neuroendocrine carcinoma and a small cell carcinoma. And the problem is that it comes in very uh, in various guises. It can be composed of round cells, polygonal cells, or spindle cells. And the cytology is not going to be all that helpful to make this diagnosis of a typical carcinoid. You're going to have to pay more attention to. Um, the architecture, and at least as far as I'm concerned, to me the architecture is really critical for making this diagnosis well over the cytology and the mitotic activity. Another important fact to remember about these atypical carcinoids is that these tumors, no matter how bad they look, no matter how atypical or how high the mitotic activity or how primitive the cells may look, they will retain an organoid architecture. And that's what sets them apart from poorly differentiated neuroendocrine carcinoma. The, the definition of a poorly differentiated neuroendocrine carcinoma is a neuroendocrine carcinoma that no longer resembles any normal counterpart or, or, or what would be the well differentiated counterpart. And the, the hallmark of a neuroendocrine carcinoma is the neuroendocrine growth pattern. So poorly differentiated neuroendocrine carcinomas are the ones that we call neuroendocrine because of the immunistic chemistry and electron microscopy, but we cannot call them neuroendocrine on the basis of the h &E because all we see is sheets, sheets of primitive, small, round, blue cell. So what are some of the pitfalls for endoscopic diagnosis for uh, atypical carcinoma? Well, the organoid growth pattern may not be easily recognized and can be very subtle. I'm going to show you a few examples of atypical carcinoids and their growth patterns. And the cell pollen or the growth of or the nodules that form these atypical carcinoids tend to be much larger than in well differentiated neuroendocrine carcinomas in, in typical carcinoids. Uh, whereas in typical carcinoids, you have small provecular ribbons, festoons, or little islands, and cell pollen. In atypical carcinoids, those balls of cells are much bigger. So when you put a needle in there, or if you take a little bite out of it, uh, you might just be getting a piece of it, and you won't realize that what you're looking at is a huge ball that is not been captured by the virus. So that's one limitation that you can have. Um, you also have the fact that the large cell morphology may overlap with non-small cell lung cancer. Uh, 
uh, of other types, non-neuron. The neuroendocrine chromatin pattern may not always be present in the tumor cells, in these tumors. They may start losing that pattern, and they may acquire very prominent nucleoli. And the prominent nucleoli and the mitotic figures can suggest a non-small cell lung cancer when you look at these on small biopsies. And then the music chemical stains may not always show convincing positivity, or they may not show the correct stain pattern, which is one of the problems that we have to deal with on a daily basis as we utilize these tools, which are wonderful, immunity chemistry and whatever else is coming down the pipe, wonderful. The only problem is we need to temper them, and we need to always balance them with the clinical information, the morphology, and we should learn to continue to be surgical pathologist instead of becoming immunopathologist. Here's an example of an atypical carcinoma. This is a core biopsy, and you can see these large, large chunks of tissue with areas of necrosis adjacent to it, almost forming sheets, but not quite. Here you get a little bit of a hint of some architecture, like it's starting to ball up which is quite different from what you expect in a small cell cancer. And then here, you can see abnormal mitotic figures, large nuclei, not really much of a neuroendocrine growth pattern, but abundant cytoplasm in this cluster of cells. Here is another part of the same core biopsy, and here you start to see these trabecula. You're already seeing a little bit of an architecture. Not much, but there is some of it left. So you do have a little bit of an or a hint of an organoid pattern. You have a large cell morphology. You have abundant cytoplasm. You have mitotic figures. So you stay it up. And this is a staining pattern with chrome granite. And this is your proliferation marker, the KI67. I neglected to show you a picture of what KI67 looks like in a well-differentiated neuroendocrine carcinoma or carcinoid tumor, but I can paint a picture for you. It's completely negative. You might find one or two positive cells here and there, but it's negative. And the same applies to the uh, TTIF. It's completely negative in well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumors. Not so for when these tumors start losing their differentiation and becoming more aggressive and becoming more atypical. Then you start seeing you know, much more increased proliferative activity. Uh, you start seeing scattered uh, TTF1 cells, et cetera, et cetera. So the most important differential diagnosis for these tumors is between low-grade atypical carcinoid and typical carcinoid. But criteria for this have not been yet developed. And, and you would be amazed that there was a very um, significant, a very well-cited paper coming from Mass General Hospital about 20 years ago um, by Dr. Marx, in which he presented a proposal for subclassifying atypical carcinoids into low-grade atypical carcinoids, into medium-grade atypical carcinoids, and high-grade atypical carcinoids. Needless to say, that proposal did not go very far uh, because you know it was hard enough to just simply classify it into a typical carcinoid and to then bring it down into low grade, intermediate, and high was quite an exercise, so people did not follow suit. Another important differential diagnosis is with large cell carcinoma with neuroendocrine differentiation. And what is this large cell carcinoma with neuroendocrine differentiation? Lung cancers that are non small cell with large cell morphology that does not show a neuroendocrine growth pattern by conventional histology, there is no organoid pattern, but when you stand up, it's positive for neuroendocrine markers. So, you know, what do you call those tumors? The experts have given it the name of non-small cell carcinoma with large cell morphology and neuroendocrine differentiation is what they call it, or phenotype. So it can get confusing. So what are some of the problems associated with the diagnosis of atypical carcinoid? A typical carcinoid shows significant overlap with several other conditions, and that's what the problem is. It shows overlap with typical carcinoid. 
It shows overlap with basaloid squamous carcinoma of the lung because a typical carcinoma, one of the characteristic growth patterns is that it has peripheral palisading of nuclei in the lobules, which gives it a very basaloid uh, appearance. So they can be confused for basaloid squamous carcinoma of the lung. You need to apply immune chemical stain. It can be confused for large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma, and we're going to look at that later. And this is the other one that I that I mentioned previously. What are the growth patterns in a typical carcinoma when you look at resection specimens? They always retain a vague organoid or nested pattern, but not generally show ribbons, festoons, rosettes, or so on. In a typical carcinoma, it's going to be a sort of very crude organoid. Uh, pattern of growth, not the delicate and very striking, you know, with carcinoid tumors, you wish you could take a picture and put it into a tie because it would look so pretty. Um, with these, it wouldn't look like anything. The most common pattern is a basaloid pattern with vague palisading of tumor cells around large nests. And one of the characteristic features of a typical carcinoma is one of the, the I, I look at a glass slide on scanning magnification and my knee-jerk reflex is a typical carcinoid when I see comedo-like central areas of necrosis around large, very solid, and cellular nests of cells. Because that doesn't happen with a basaloid squamous carcinoma. <coughs> but it's 100% seen in every single atypical carcinoma that I have seen so far. <coughs> the nuclear features, however, can be very tricky because there's a spectrum that ranges from the classical salt and pepper chromatin a very large, dense, hyperchromatic nuclei with prominent nucleoli. And also, the cells show a tendency to be polygonal or spindle rather than being round. All of these features may be difficult to assess in small endoscopic biopsies, making the diagnosis of a typical carcinoma very difficult if you're dealing with an endoscopic biopsy. So, here you have an example of a tumor. You can see very solid sheets of cells with some variability in the cell size. In other areas, you start seeing these big nodules <coughs> with central comedo-like areas of necrosis. Very striking. Here you have it on higher magnification, the central comedo-like areas of necrosis. And this is what the cytology looks like. Mitotic figures, cells are polygonal rather than being round, and they tend to show prominent nucleoli, or some of them at least show nucleoli. Here's another example of an atypical carcinoma. You can see some residual nesting, very vague, very subtle, but notice the necrosis. This amount of necrosis, no matter how uniform and bland the cells look, on higher magnification should not be present in a benign neuroendocrine tumor. You, you don't have, there is no such thing as the equivalent of the lobular carcinoma in situ with necrosis in the lung. So by definition, the minute you start seeing this, you have to worry. When you see this on scanning or intermediate magnification, you have to worry. And you have to start looking more carefully at this particular case. Here you have it, the necrosis, cytology. Some of the cells start looking much bigger and atypical, which should already be a, a, a clue. Here you have another example of a uh, atypical carcinoid, a little bit of nesting, but notice that the cells start to spindle. And this is very common in these tumors. In fact, out of my collection of atypical carcinoids, I think that two thirds of them are of a spindle cell type and they have striking spindling of the tumor cells. And now I'd like to just turn your attention to large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma. Uh, and here's the definition of large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma is defined as a large cell carcinoma showing histological features such as organoid nesting, vector, rosette-like, and palisading patterns that suggest neuroendocrine differentiation on the H and E, and in which the latter can be confirmed by immunohistochemistry or electromicroscopy. So to make this diagnosis, there are two things that need to happen. You need to have a tumor that when you look at it, you go, gosh, this looks neuroendocrine. It's got some sort of a neuroendocrine pattern on the HD. 
In other words, if what you're looking at is a tumor composed of sheets or anything that does not resemble even remotely a neuroendocrine neoplasm, then you can abandon that thought. That, that doesn't even fall in, into the bin of differential diagnosis. And then when you have identified this vague neuroendocrine, neuroendocrine field that it gives you, then you have to go and confirm it with the same. And you have to demonstrate that it not only looks neuroendocrine, it actually is neuroendocrine because it's staining positive for all the neuroendocrine markers. So that is the definition if you read the WHO book. And here's an example of one of these tumors. See, that looks pretty neuroendocrine. You know, these are ribbons, uh, maybe little um, uh, asinine in here. Um, here you have, again, this ribbon-like pattern, the peripheral palisading of the nuclei. Um, and, and then when you look at it under higher magnification, it doesn't look like a carcinoid. These cells are too atypical. Look at, look at these mitotic figures. Look at the size of the nuclei, the, the nucleoli. This is too crazy for a well-differentiated tumor of any type. And then when you state it up, other for chromal ground. So there you have it. You have a neuroendocrine histologic pattern of growth in a lung tumor that is positive for neuroendocrine markers, large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma. So to recap, diagnosis requires two indispensable elements, which are growth pattern and immunohistochemistry. chemistry. The problem is that neuroendocrine growth pattern can be often difficult to demonstrate in these tumors in small biopsies. Same as with atypical carcinomas. And immune chemical stains may not always be reliable or helpful when the tumor is a high-grade tumor. So this is the latest recommendation from the International Association of Lung Cancer, uh, the Association of Thoracic Surgery in the United States and the Euro European Respiratory Society. For the, bi for the biopsy diagnosis of large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma. You either call it non-small cell carcinoma with neuroendocrine morphology and positive neuroendocrine markers, possible large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma, or you call it non-small cell carcinoma with neuroendocrine morphology and negative neuroendocrine markers, large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma suspected. And this is what the book says. I'm not kidding. <laughs> So the official recommendation is that you can only call it possible or suspected. But you essentially what the WHO book is saying, you cannot make this diagnosis on an endoscopic biopsy. You, know, you can suspect it or you can suggest it, but you can't uh, establish that diagnosis. Here's an example of a case that was called a large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma on a core biopsy. And you can see this is a right upper lung mass in a 54-year-old non-smoker. And you have these nests, or large nests or lobules, if you want to call them, of tumor cells with very striking peripheral palisading. You can see that on this very, very scanning magnification. Here you have a higher magnification, a few um, micro structures in the middle, almost giving it a piriform appearance. And here you have them higher power, very large cells, abundant cytoplasm, uh, mitotic activity, lots of apoptotic activity. And then you do the stains, and this is what this tumor is stained like, the synaptophysin, which is usually much more uh, sensitive than the chromogranin, and will stain more often than the chromogranin. Um, you can see is there is staining, but it's mostly negative. And then this was a chrome granite, and I purposely took it at a higher power to be more convincing that this is indeed staining with chrome granite. But, you know, out of this particular lobule, there's maybe one fifth of the lobule that is being, that the cells are staining positive for chrome granite. So, despite the imperfections, and despite the fact that it's not reading the book, it is staining for synaptophysin, it is staining for chromogranin, it does show an organoid pattern according to the book, and therefore, to make my life easier, I just call it a large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma and be done with it. Am I 100% sure? No, but it's the best I can do. Now, here's a TTF1, in this case, and a CD56, which were very helpful in this particular instance. 
because DPF1, which is a marker of lung adenocarcinoma, but is also strongly expressed in fully differentiated neuroendocrine carcinoma, such as small cell cancer, um, was very strongly positive, pushing me away from the atypical carcinoid or typical carcinoid category into a much more aggressive group because every single cell almost is the positive here. And then C56 is not a specific marker of neuroendocrine differentiation, but it's quite sensitive. And this one is much better than staining, much more than staphylococcus and chromogranin. So I was very happy to have the stain because, yeah, it's, it's neuroendocrine. So large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma, the definition is that of a tumor composed of large cells displaying neuroendocrine growth pattern plus positive staining for neuroendocrine markers. Most common pattern in these tumors is large tumor cells or large tumor nets with peripheral palisading. And these are features that are best appreciated in resection specimens, but, um, and more so, even when you have them, it's not distinctive for, for this tumor. You can also see it in other types of tumors. And this growth pattern can overlap with several other lung tumors, uh, including all of these. And I'm going to talk a little bit also later about this polygonal or intermediate cell type of small cell cancer. Um, those of you who have some gray in your hair or have no hair anymore probably will remember the intermediate type of small cell cancer. And those who are even older will remember the older term of polygonal cell type. Uh, which is a category of uh, lung tumor that is reserved for neuroendocrine tumors that are considered part of the family of small cell carcinoma, but have a different morphology because the cells are no longer small. They're polygonal or intermediate or large. And we'll talk about that later. So what is my recommended approach on small biopsy samples? If the growth pattern is characteristic for a neurodermine tumor and the results of the stains are unequivocal, then you can call it consistent with fully differentiated neurodermine carcinoma of large cell type. That's what I do. Uh, if findings are not typical, then what I do is I call it fully differentiated large cell carcinoma with a comment that differential diagnosis includes large cell neurodermine carcinoma and a definitive diagnosis awaits examination of a resective specimen. Why, uh, why do you have to be so specific? It's a biopsy. You're already telling them it's cancer. They have to remove it. You know, wait until it's removed, and then review the whole thing, and then give your final diagnosis. You don't have to commit yourself on a small biopsy. Um, if you have strong positivity for TTF1 with a high proliferation index, more than 30% of the nuclei are positive for mid one uh, and positive neuroendocrine markers, that can be helpful for the diagnosis. Help reinforce the diagnosis. Now, fully differentiated small cell neuroendocrine carcinoma. Um, this we all know is a misnomer because these cells are not really that small. They're about three times the size of small lymphocytes. What we do know is that to qualify for this diagnosis, the features that we that these tumors need to have is these cells are characterized by very scant cytoplasm. If you have any tumor, any biopsy of the tumor in the lung, and those tumor cells in that biopsy have abundant cytoplasm, the last thing you want to call it is a small cell cancer. It, by definition, it cannot be. Small cell cancer will show only nuclei. You will need special stains to see the cytoplasm. The nuclei are very characteristic in these tumors. They're finely granular, they look smudged. They look like an elephant stepped on. With uh, the nuclear chromatin is, is, is sort of dispersed evenly throughout and nucleoli are either absent or they're very faint. But you should not see prominent nucleoli in small cell cancer. If you have anything that shows prominent nucleoli, that's not part of your differential diagnosis. They have high mitotic rate, more than 11 for 10 high power fields. The median mitotic rate is usually 80 mitosis for 10 high power fields. Large areas of necrosis is characteristic. It's required for the diagnosis of small cell cancer. It, it's like Ewing sarcoma. There is no such thing as a Ewing sarcoma without necrosis. There is no such thing as a small cell cancer without necrosis. Apoptosis, very common. 
And you have loss of the neuroendocrine growth pattern with frequent artifactual distortion of cells. So what are some of the challenges on endoscopic biopsy? Well, there's loss of architectural growth pattern. Um, there's extensive crushing artifact. There's paucity of viable tumor cells on account of the crushing of the cells. And this, which last but not least, inconsistent immunity chemical results. So here we have a typical biopsy of a small cell cancer. And you can see bronchial gland, gland in here, which is still preserved. Some round cell, a lot of it is smudging. And here you have higher power, even higher power. You have to hunt for the areas where there is preservation of neuter features. And then when you look at the neuter features, you see these much nuclei, scan cytoplasm, apoptosis, high mitotic activity, and that's where your diagnosis lies. And here's the immunity chemistry. This particular case, this is the cytokeratin stain you see here on the scanning magnification that is staining positive for cytokeratin. Here you see it at higher magnification. You can see that it's a dot-like pattern of staining. The dot-like pattern, paranuclear pattern of staining, is very characteristic for small cell cancer. And when you get a lung biopsy that has crushed cells and you stain it with cytokeratin and you get this dot-like paranuclear pattern, you can rest assured that you're dealing with a small cell lung cancer. But now let me show you some of the other things. This is a grown grand zippo. And here's the synaptophysin. On this particular case, I can show you dozens of similar cases in which both the chromogranin and the synaptophysin were negative. Here's another example of a small cell carcinoma. You can see the bronchial mucosa and then the sheets of uh, monotonous tumor cells in the background. Here's the CK7, strong positivity. Synapto, maybe a few cells here and there. Chromogram, nothing. <laughs> Here's another example of an endoscopic biopsy in a, in a small cell lung cancer. Notice that there's a mixture of round cells with cells that look a little bit spindle. And here you have it on high magnification, the spindle cell area. Notice that the cells have much nuclear chromatin. There are mitotic figures. There's very scant cytoplasm. And uh, look at all these abnormal mitoses. This is the spindle cell variant of small cell carcinoma. And here's a keratin stain on this case, in high magnification. And here's a chromogranin. C56, thankfully, was strongly positive, because this is sort of difficult to interpret. And then TTF1, just to reiterate what I said before, TTF1 is always going to be very strongly positive, nuclear positivity in small cell cancer and most poorly differentiated neuroendocrine carcinomas. Here you have another example of the uh, spindle cell type of small cell cancer. And look at this crushing, and this basically this is uninterpretable. This is very hard. If, if you didn't know that it was an endoscopic lung biopsy, you would be lost. And here's a keratin stain, and the keratin is usually very reliable and reproducible for small cell cancer. So it's the preferred stain for, for making the diagnosis. So to summarize endoscopic diagnosis of small cell cancer, this is an HD diagnosis. You need to learn to make this diagnosis, to have the guts to make this diagnosis on HD. Because it can sometimes be daunting when the whole sample is crushed and all you see is you know, smudged cells and, and no preserved uh, items. When in difficulties, you can use immunistic chemistry, but remember that the results of the stains may be more trouble than help. So use them judiciously. Negative staining for neuroendocrine markers should not be relied upon as a criterion for not making a diagnosis of small cell lung cancer. In fact, from what I've seen so far, the majority of them are negative. So I don't even bother in ordering the chromogram and the synaptophysin. What I'm ordering now is the CD56, the TTF1, cytokeratin, and the 
MIB, MIB-1 proliferation marker when I work up these cases. And of course, make sure that before you sign out anything as a small cell carcinoma, you have a conversation with your friendly uh, endoscopist and the doctor who's taking care of this patient to make sure that uh, it checks out clinically with, uh, with, with your semen. Again, just to go over some of the concepts that we, that we talked about, the histologic spectrum of small cell carcinoma includes the conventional old cell type of small cell carcinoma, the lymphocyte-like type, the spindle cell type, and then there's the polygonal or intermediate cell type. There is also an entity known as small cell, large cell carcinoma, or a tumor that shows a combination of both small cells and large cells intimate with mix within the same tumor mass. And then, of course, you can have combinations of small cell cancer with literally any other type of lung cancer. So here you have an example, and to make sure that I gave you the real goods, this is a slide from a slide set collection from the AFIB. It was included in the slide set about 25 years ago as the polygonal cell, the intermediate cell type of small cell cancer. And I challenge you and Mr. AFIP to come and tell me why this is not an atypical carcinoid or a large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma. And why is this a small cell carcinoma? Why do we have to class it with a small cell carcinoma? And I have to tell you that I've seen very experienced pathologists, pathologists who I respect very highly, make the diagnosis of small cell carcinoma when they see tumors like this. And it's not that it's wrong, I'm not criticizing it, but what I'm saying is, you know, you can call it what you like. What do our colleagues understand may be a completely different issue. You know, because I can get away with defending a diagnosis of atypical carcinoma here if I get positive chromogram into this tumor. And there, there won't be too many arguments that will, that will shut me down. And then, of course, it makes small cell, large cell carcinoma. So what are some of the lingering problem areas? There's still a number of entities described in the literature that have not been adequately characterized, despite being officially recognized by the WHO. They're mentioned in the book, but the criteria are just not there. And if you look at the references, the, the references are non-existent. You, you can't look it up anywhere. There appears to be considerable overlap among several lung tumors that can show similar features, including typical carcinoids, like cell neuroendocrine carcinomas, um, et cetera, et cetera, that we talked about. And in my mind, I have to tell you that I'm not sure, because it's not yet clear to me whether these actually correspond to distinct and separate entities, or whether we have just been splitting because we didn't know any better, and we did not have the opportunity to all sit around and get together and, and pool cases so that we can arrive at a consensus and for that reason, everybody, every group that presented their paper interpreted it in their own way. So we don't know if it's really different tumors or it's all the same type. So we have quite a bit of overlap between these conditions. So just to mention a few of the issues. Difference between large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma versus atypical carcinoma. There seems to be quite a bit of overlap in morphologic features and clinical behavior between large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma and atypical carcinoma. No clear distinguishing features seem to be apparent to separate these two tumors since both display a neuroendocrine growth pattern, are positive for neuroendocrine markers, and they have large cells. So you have to consider the possibility that they're all the same. That maybe what people have been calling large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma and a typical carcinoma is actually the same tumor. To me, it certainly seems that way. The more I go back on my files and I look at the cases that I collected over 25 years and I look at the things that were labeled as a typical carcinoid and I look at them and I say, gosh, today I would have called this a large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma. And then I try to find a good example of a typical carcinoid for a lecture and man, they all keep turning out as large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma. There is an entity called basal explainers carcinoma, which is in the uh, WHO books. 
They also share similar architectural patterns of growth and cytologic features, and can only be separated by the demonstration of uh, neuroendocrine differentiation. The only problem is the majority of, or the few studies that are out there on this entity, they don't have any immune chemical study. It's just I one. And it's based on the squamous carcinoma because I say so. So making this distinction, whether it is on a section specimen or a biopsy, can be a headache. Here you have an example of large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma. Here's a basaloid squamous cell carcinoma. Other than for these small islands that look a little bit squamous, it would be hard to tell them apart. Here's a P63 on this particular tumor, which helps you um, identify it as a squamous cell carcinoma. So what are some of the gray areas that we have here? Distinction between moderately and poorly differentiated neuroendocrine carcinoma is a problem. Uh, telling the difference between, or drawing the line between an atypical carcinoid versus a spindle cell, small cell lung cancer. Uh, an atypical carcinoid versus the polygonal type of small cell lung cancer. A typical carcinoid versus large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma. There's a lot of overlap histologically with all of these three tumors, and uh, we just don't have any good criteria right now. This is an area that we still need to work on because it's very confusing. And there's no literature on it. No studies have been done. And we have a distinction between large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma and other tumors, including the basal exquamous carcinoma and large cell carcinoma with neuroendocrine pattern. So I, it was not my intention to confuse you or to make this topic a little bit um, you know, more esoteric, but the fact is we do have a lot of work yet to do, and my prediction is in the next following five to 10 years, if we can uh, stimulate some of our very diligent residents in the Medical College of Wisconsin Department of Pathology to uh, do some work on this, we may be able to shed some clarity on this topic. So correct preoperative diagnosis is rarely accomplished in these tumors, either on biopsy or cytology. And I'm speaking in general about neuroendocrine uh, carcinomas of the uh, lung. Endoscopic biopsies must be interpreted with caution, avoiding committing to a definitive diagnosis when the findings are not absolutely classical. If it's a dead ringer and there's no question in your mind what you're dealing with, then by all means go ahead and call it, but don't be a cowboy, don't be a hero, and if it's not clear, rather than just going for the small cell carcinoma diagnosis or something of the sort, send it out or ask them to take another biopsy at, at the worst. Thank you very much. Uh, do we have any questions before we move on to the next? Uh